physician, a lot of times we're tasked with the responsibility of providing medicines and surgeries and different options for people who are dealing with medical conditions. It's not often we're able to take a step back and talk about wellness and how we can prevent these conditions. So hopefully this will be an interesting lecture for everyone this evening. <clears throat> My name is Brian Steichner. I consider myself your urologic trail guide tonight. I use that term loosely. Uh, I'm new here in uh, Lake Tahoe. I come here from Philadelphia where I was working at the University of Pennsylvania for the past 10 years. Um, I am a uh, urologic trail guide, but I bet most people in this room are a better trail guide than I am. Uh, I've explored up in those mountains and I get lost frequently. Uh, I'm honored to be here. I come to you from a much bigger hospital, but I think this hospital provides a lot for our community. Um, there's a lot of quality doctors here that really care about this community. Uh, and that's tough to find in a lot of places around this country. Um, I almost took a job at uh, Dartmouth when I actually had the contract in my hand and I came out and interviewed and I like the place so much that I came out here. So hopefully together as a team, uh, we can cure urology conditions. So <clears throat> this is a picture of not people coming to my office. Typically the man that come to my office, the woman come to my office, is the woman dragging the man begrudgingly. <laughs> so my hope is that the lecture tonight provides you with some opportunity to understand what it is I do but more importantly, how you can prevent ever seeing me, which is probably what most men and most women want. <clears throat> so we have a lot to cover tonight. Um, we're gonna cover what the urologic system is. Um, it's interesting to me that when I deal with practitioners in the health system, the community, not a lot of people completely understand what the urinary tract is and what it is that we do. Then I'm gonna tell you how it breaks, which is perhaps the most important thing for my practice. But instead of telling you how I can fix it, the medicines and the surgeries that are available to you, I'm gonna hopefully give you some insight in how you can prevent it, which is a completely different way of looking at things. Uh, we'll have time for questions and answers at the end, but if there's something you're dying to ask me, just yell it out. We got a small group here tonight, so don't feel free to yell it out. I realize that a lot of what I do, it deals in discretion. Um, there's some sensitive subjects here, so if you wanna to talk to me afterwards about specific things, just come up and grab me, we can talk about anything. So what is urology? Urology is the branch of medicine that deals with functions of the urinary tract, but also deals with the male genital system. <clears throat> so we'll take a look at the female urology. I think it's important to point out a lot of people think urologists just take care of men, and it is a large percentage of what we do, but 40% of the people in our practice are actually women. Um, it's important to point out that the kidneys don't discriminate. Both men and women have kidneys. The kidneys filter blood and make urine. I'll show you a picture next about exactly how that happens and why it's important. After the kidneys make urine, the urine drains down these long tubes that are about the size of a piece of spaghetti on either side. They're called the ureters, and then drains down into the bladder. The bladder's function is to store urine until it's a socially acceptable time for you to empty your bladder, which can be a problem for some people, and that's why I'm here. <clears throat> so to look deeper into the kidney, the kidney sees about 25% of the blood that your heart pumps. That's the largest amount of blood going to any organ system in the body. It's more important than the heart, I'm sorry, the lungs. It's more important than the brain. It's more important than the GI tract. Um, I'm just kidding, those things are all important. But I'd like to pretend like we're really important. Um, so uh, the kidneys will filter about uh, your total blood volume 50 to 60 times a day, meaning that it's really seeing all of your blood. It's filtering it over and over again. And the kidneys, which are composed of millions and millions of tiny little systems called the collecting system, will filter that blood, process it, and reabsorb 99% of it. Only 1% of that total blood volume that's filtered every day is excreted in the form of urine. The urine is then trapped down in the bladder. Below the bladder, there's a little sphincter muscle in women. In men, the bush below that is the prostate. Uh, the bladder is just a simple muscle that's designed to expand and store urine, and when the time is right, you empty your bladder. So below the kidneys, the kidneys are incredibly complex in how they work. The bladder is incredibly simple. It's one of the dumbest organs in your body, which is why I like it. <clears throat> in addition to female urology, men have the kidneys, the ureters, and the bladder, but I also deal with the male genital system. So we're talking about sexual function, sperm production, testosterone production, erections, fertility, um, and those things are specific to men in my field. The women's side of this is your GYN, uh, but there is some overlap in certain conditions. So what is the male genital urinary system? The testicles produce, the testicles have two functions. The first function of the testicles is to produce testosterone. Testosterone gives us our sex drive, our energy level, um, makes us a male. That goes out into the bloodstream in all men. The testicles also produce sperm, which travels up through a little structure called the epididymis. I'd like to say that's where sperm learn to swim. And then travels up the vas deferens 
through the prostate where it picks up some of the nutrients it needs to survive, and then outside of the body. And you'll recognize the vas deferens, that's what we divide during a vasectomy. And the prostate becomes incredibly important for fertility, but it also becomes an incredibly big pain in the neck as we get older, and we'll talk about that. <clears throat> so how does it break? I know this is a long list. We're going to focus on the ones that have a red dot next to them, but I wanted to illustrate exactly what it is that we do, because the breadth of urology is, is quite large. There are four cancers we take care of, prostate, kidney, bladder, and testicle. We take care of kidney stones, and there's about six or seven different types of kidney stones that happen, but primarily calcium stones. We take care of a lot of voiding issues. It's probably the number one thing we take care of. In men, a lot of times that has to deal with an enlarging prostate that happens with age. In women, it has to do with the types of incontinence. We deal with urinary tract infections and strictures of the small tube that drains the bladder. When it comes to male sexual health, we take care of erectile dysfunction, low testosterone. And when it comes to infertility in this country, which is kind of a growing epidemic, 30% of the infertility is primarily related to the male partner. Um, so about 50% is completely related to both, and a large percent is due to the woman. So we deal with all the male factor issues. <clears throat> We take care of pediatric urologic issues. Most people don't know this, but the urinary tract is the number one congenital malformations in the, in, of the, all systems in the body. So I used to work at the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia, and we had tons and tons of babies born with um, urologic and genital malformations. In fact, I was terrified to have kids for the longest time. Because <laughs> well, my kid would have all these problems. There's a whole bunch of them. And, um, interestingly, the specialty of uh, GYN doesn't have a pediatric subspecialty to it. so. During uh, childhood and adolescence, we actually take care of the pediatric GYN conditions as well. So let's get into this. <clears throat> I'm telling you a lot about a lot of number ones here tonight. And again, we have a lot of records that we're not proud for. But of all the systems in the body, the urinary tract actually has the number one combined number of cancers. So there's a lot going on in this slide. If you look at the top of it, this is the National Cancer Institute database numbers from 2018. And if you add up the male side, top left corner, you'll see that prostate, bladder, and kidneys make up almost 30% of the 800 to 900,000 new cancer diagnosis in our country. So we're talking about the largest percentage of cancers occupying all men happen in the urinary tract. And I like to equate for, for the women out there, prostate is sort of the breast cancer of our world. Um, unfortunately, men don't talk about things like women did, or we have three-day marches with men talking about prostate cancer, but it doesn't happen as much as, as I wish it would. In women, um, prostate and bladder go, women don't have a prostate, so that goes away, and urinary bladder due to smoking is not as prevalent in women, but we do see a large percentage of women dealing with kidney and diseases of the, of the collecting system. <clears throat> the good news, if you look at the bottom of this slide, we're doing a good job. So if you look at the cure rates or the death rates for prostate cancer and kidney cancer, they're actually quite low. And I credit that to screening. <clears throat> so some numbers. In their lifetime, one in nine men will get prostate cancer. It's a huge number if you think about it. And there's currently approximately three million men living with prostate cancer in our country. And that's men over the age of 50 and the male population. So it's a large percentage of men. Your risk of developing prostate cancer equals your age. So between 70 and older, you have about a 1 in 10% chance of developing prostate cancer or having prostate cancer. And what we're often quote to men is if you live long enough, you're probably going to get prostate cancer. In fact, about 100% of men at age 100, if biopsy, will have pathological diagnosis of prostate cancer. So it's in all our futures if you're a man in this room. <clears throat> How does cancer happen? So this is kind of a broad slide. There are two genetic defects that essentially happen when you develop cancer. One is called a tumor suppressor gene or something in your body, in your genetic system, that prevents cancer from occurring. The second is a pro-oncogene, or something that accelerates cell growth. A mutation to any one of those genetic lineages will actually induce tumor production. So what happens is you get some sort of genetic mutation, and something happens to that, either something you drink or eat, or exposure to some chemical, or just a genetic predisposition to it. That turns on cancer, which is an abnormal proliferation of cells. Prostate cancer grows in the back of the prostate. If you look at slide number two, and I apologize, my pointer thing isn't working. I point all this out to you. <clears throat> you can see the small white area in the back of the prostate. That's a, that's a prostate cancer that's confined to the organ, to the gland, and the cure rates for organ-confined prostate cancer are approaching 98%. So that's great news. The problem is, when you look at the third part of this slide, once cancer gets outside of the organ, cure rates are much lower at 28%. Prostate cancer is a little bit different than some of the other cancers you may be familiar with. It doesn't break off and spread via the blood system. 
It actually grows into the lymph nodes locally and then can expand into the bones. So it spreads a little bit differently and opens up a window for cure even if you have locally advanced disease because we can still kind of cut that surgery with surgery, remove that, or do radiation. <clears throat> I like this slide because we know that prostate cancer doesn't discriminate. Um, all men, all ethnicities are targets. I also like this slide because it's important for two reasons. You see all the politicians up here? <laughs> so that means we get a lot of funding. Um, what that means is prostate cancer has affected a lot of famous politicians uh, and people like Warren Buffett have a lot of money. So we got a lot of money at our fingertips for research and for advancement. So the good news is we're making a lot of progress, uh, which is important. So let's talk about screening. <clears throat> we'll make it easy on you. The American Cancer Society says you don't have to check, and my society says you do. Um, there's a lot of controversy in prostate cancer screening. If you go online and you do your research or you talk to enough doctors or urologists, you'll get different answers from everyone. And there's some reasons for that. The reasons are the PSA test, or the blood test that we use to screen for prostate cancer, is a bad test. It was invented in the early 90s. So what is it? PSA is a blood test. It's a protein produced by your prostate that is involved in some of the nutrients and liquefaction of sperm that happens during fertility. What we know is that we use PSA, or an elevation in your PSA, as a marker for the possibility that you may have cancer. But it's not specific to cancer. Prostate, a PSA test can go up for a lot of reasons. And the enlarging prostate that happens with age, urinary tract infections, sexual activity, um, <clears throat> certain medicines can make it go up. And what's very unique to Tahoe is vigorous exercise in the form of biking. That never came up in Philadelphia. That's every patient in Lake Tahoe. <laughs> Everyone I see, I have to say, you can't ride your bike for three days. You would think I would tell them they have to, like, you know, give away their firstborn kid. <clears throat> so, what we know is that the other reason it's a bad test is the sensitivity of it. What I mean by sensitivity is if you have a, an abnormal PSA test, if your PSA test is elevated, you still only have about a 25% chance of being positive for prostate cancer. So that's good and bad. Because it's good because when you come into my office and you're terrified that you have <laughs> prostate cancer, I can tell you the overwhelming chances that you don't. But it's bad because we have no way of telling whose test is, that's abnormal is due to something serious. So we're still searching for that holy grail of prostate cancer screening. <clears throat> Here's the bad news. I do a lot of rectal exams. And this is why a lot of men avoid my office. But again, when we combine a PSA test, with a rectal exam, we increase the ability to determine who's really at risk. Rectal exam in good hands only has the ability to be correct about 15% of the time. So if you walk in my office and your primary care doctor said, hey, felt my exam felt a little bit odd. Brian, he wanted you to see me. I still tell you, you have 85% chance of not having cancer. So we have the number one cancer in, the, in this country in men. We have a huge increase in rates, but we don't have a good way of detecting it. So there's a lot of controversy of if we should screen, because we're putting a lot of men through testing, putting a lot of men through biopsies, and a lot of those men are actually being negative. <clears throat> now, there are some good news for men. If your PSA value is very low, there was data that came out last year that the rectal exam is unnecessary. So if your PSA is less than 1.5, you and I both get a break for that day. What's my recommendation? Currently, I recommend that all men who come into my office at age 50 should have a rectal exam and a blood test. That doesn't mean we have to act on it but it does mean we have more information that provide an individual approach. I like to have the conversation. The more we know, the better. The more PSA values I have, the more times we've done a rectal exam, the more information we can put together to make an informed decision about whether or not we need to do something or whether or not we can go out of our way to leave you alone. <clears throat> I should point out, African-American men and men who have a first-degree relative with prostate cancer should probably begin the screening at age 40. I think we used to overscreen men, and recently, the United States Preventive Task Force actually put out recommendations that you shouldn't screen at all. That's the American Cancer Society's recommendations. I think the pendulum probably shifted a little bit too far. My expectation is that prostate cancer screening will eventually mirror colon cancer screening. We will get an early PSA test and a rectal exam, and based upon your initial values, we'll predict whether or not you need to have it every year, every five years, or perhaps every ten years. And I think that's where common sense will prevail. <coughs> What are the risk factors and what can we do to prevent prostate cancer? This is typically when I start to talk to you about fancy robotic surgery and radiation. But we're going to shift gears tonight and talk more about prevention. Unfortunately, three of the four main products we can't affect. We're all going to get older. We all have parents and we're all born the way we are. 
and those things predict your risk of cancer. But there are some environmental and dietary things that we can do, and hopefully we can focus a little bit on that. So what I call the prostate cancer diet. There are four aspects, four things that have been studied that have been shown statistically to contribute to your increased risk of prostate cancer. Number one, vegetable fat is better than animal fat. The majority of this data comes out of colon cancer, but it's been extrapolated into prostate cancer. What do we know is that the breakdown or the um, catalyst of animal fat can lead to a production of something called a heterocyclicamine. And the next slide will show you what that means and why that matters. <clears throat> Second is lycopene, found in tomatoes can inhibit blood vessel growth and actually can inhibit some of the elements of DNA synthesis so it can actually block any cancer from getting blood flow which means it's got a greater chance of dying and actually prevent mutations from happening. The data is loose. We thought we were onto something promising about 10, 15 years ago, um, but we're still, at, we're still promoting it as a preventative measure. Selenium as well, fish and nuts, that inhibits cell growth. And sugar is bad. I mean, I think we all know that at this point, refined carbs, um, sugar, it's one of the worst things we can take in. Uh, and I'll go into that why. So a lot going on here, but I'll make it simple for you. There's red meat, there's processed meat. If you put a catalyst to that, which is mainly fire or heat, and you heat it to a high temperature, you cause these substances that cause cancer. So they cause DNA damage in your, in your genes. They turn on things called KRAS and P53. That's those pro-oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes that I talked about. They activate the bad things or turn off the good things. And they take a normal cell, they make it abnormal, and then it begins to divide out of control. So it is the charring of meats and the charring of processed meats that puts you at an increased risk of prostate cancer. It's level one evidence in colon cancer, it's actually level two evidence in prostate. So it's not statistically been proven 100%, but it's something we believe contributes. Like bean turns tomatoes red, um, and for the longest time we thought this was promising. It does have to do with a receptor called insulin type growth factor. And essentially, it turns on cell division. So the lycopene is believed to inhibit cell division, which turns off cancer growth. <clears throat> Selenium found in nuts, mushrooms, uh, in your liver. Similar, it's a trace mineral. It's in most of our diets. It actually has a, um, an, interesting, uh, an interesting bimodal distribution. And what I mean by that is if you get too little selenium, it's bad. If you get too much selenium, it's good. So you have to be just right. Um, and that can be difficult at times, but just making sure you, you eat a healthy diet and add some nuts into there, you should get enough selenium that you're, you're in that safe zone. So. Uh, we could spend a whole lecture talking about sugar. Uh, it's not my specialty. Uh, I'm someone who doesn't eat a lot of carbohydrates and sugar because I believe it's probably the root of all evil. Um, but sugar turns on a lot of bad things in our body. Uh, this slide illustrates about 90 of them. Well, what we know is that sugar can be involved in a lot of DNA damage, it can be a lot of blood vessel growth, and avoiding sugar has been studied, usually in combination with chemotherapy to see how people respond to certain chemotherapies. But people put on a carbohydrate restricted or a low sugar diet actually have better response to chemotherapy, and we're believed it has to do with some of the cellular changes. So here's some things that you can do. UCSF down in San Francisco puts out a prostate cancer diet book. We have a couple in the office if someone is really interested. <coughs> Kidney cancer, second cancer I'll talk about tonight. There are a ton of different types of kidney cancers because there's a lot going on and there's a lot that can break different cells in the body, but about 75% are called clear cell. Clear cell cancers are made of the tubes that are involved in the lining of the inside of the kidney. The new cases per year, about 44,000 people, at males in this country will get it, about 30,000 female, and the average age is right around 65 years old. <clears throat> there are four stages to kidney cancer. Uh, there's a red line and a blue line on purpose. Stage one and two is uh, tumors confined to the kidney. Stage one is they're small. Stage two is they can be as big as they want, but they have to be confined to the kidney. Stage three is locally outside of the kidney and can grow even into the blood vessels. And stage four is where it has spread. And interestingly, even if it is locally advanced, our success rates and cure are still high. So we draw that line around red because it really needs to be progressively metastatic or, or really outside of the kidney before we have trouble with cure rates. <clears throat> so, good news, bad news. Kidney cancer rates are on the rise. And that terrifies a lot of people. And what we also know is that the stage at diagnosis is on the decline. So that I pointed out before, if you look at that bottom slide, there's four rows there and there's a red arrow. It takes a, you getting to a stage four kidney cancer before your risk of, of having really an adverse event goes down. And people always ask me, well, if they're on the rise, you know, what's causing this? Uh, and how are we getting a lower stage? And the answer is it's not really on the rise. We just have fancy MRI machines and CT scans that we use at will. 
um, and we're detecting these earlier. So people are coming in, they're getting their MRI for their spine issue, they're getting their CT scan because they're having belly pain, they're walking into the ER and their head hurts and they're getting six MRIs. And what we're finding is a lot of small kidney masses that wouldn't have been found before. We're catching them at an earlier rate and we're curing them earlier. So even though it appears to be on the rise, I think the actual numbers that we're detecting are actually because we're looking for it more. <clears throat> 11 risk factors for kidney cancer. Again, just like most cancers, we don't really know exactly what causes kidney cancer, but we do know smoking is one of the largest contributors. 25 to 30% of new kidney cancers have an association, statistically significant correlation to smoking. So one of the most important things you can do, exercise, eat healthy, and quit smoking. It's going to be a little bit of the trend for tonight. <clears throat> All right, same organ, different problem, kidney stones. This rock would shut down a road in Tahoe for at least six months, I've learned since being here. So um, hopefully this isn't on the way home to Myers. Um, earliest recorded kidney stone, 5,000 years ago. We've done CT scans and we've done um, necropsies or autopsies on Egyptian mummies, and we found bladder and kidney stones dating back to the beginning of time. In fact, if you read the Hippocratic Oath, it actually says, I will not cut, not even for the stone but leave disapproved practitioners who specialize in it. So historically, kidney stones is one of the most fascinating things you can read about if you're interested in history and kidney stones. And my ancestors gave the stone surgery world a bad name. There were bands of men who would travel around medieval Europe, cut out kidney stones, and get out of town, just as everyone didn't do well. So <clears throat> hopefully that's not my trend here as I'm new to town, but um, there's a, very, a lot of historic interest in kidney stones. In fact, some of the instruments we still use uh, date back to medieval times. So how do kidney stones form? Similar picture to I showed you how the kidney works. The kidney filters blood, the minerals and the elements are absorbed into the collecting system, and then 99% is reabsorbed. If you don't have enough water, it gets too concentrated. And where that red arrow is, is where some of the most concentrated urine is in that area that's beginning to drain into the kidney, and that's where the beginnings of kidney stones were formed. <clears throat> kidney stones are painful. If you talk to women who've had children with kidney stones, they'd rather have kids again than have another kidney stone. And I've had neither, but I know I'm hopefully that, that that is not in my future. Kidney stones get stuck in three spots. As they form in the kidney, they drop into that little area where they drain. There's a narrowing that happens in the upper portion of the kidney. As the kidney stone travels down, and if you look to the right, it says stone in the ureter. There's a small blood vessel that passes under there called the iliac artery. That artery actually puts pressure on the back of the ureter in that location and makes stone passage in that location somewhat more difficult. The last place is down into the bladder. Those kidney stones have to pop through a thickened bladder wall or a muscular wall of the bladder, so it's common for kidney stones to get stuck in one of those three areas. <clears throat> this year, the stats went up. One in every 10 Americans will develop kidney stones, largely a condition of men, uh, but the largest growing population of people developing kidney stones in this country is actually women, and that's due to obesity. It's directly linked to obesity. The incidence in around the world is um, high. It's not just us. This country is about 9%. Greece, it's 15%, um, which doesn't make sense. If you think they have a Mediterranean diet, it tends to be a healthy diet. But it's actually linked to genetics. There are some genetic predispositions in, in the Mediterranean culture that set them at increased risk for that. In our country, we have something called the kidney stone bell. Um, there are three reasons why people in the, or two main reasons why people in the southern portion, the red portion of this map, develop kidney stones. Number one, it's hot. People get dehydrated in Texas more than they do in Montana. But number two, a lot of people require well water, and there's a hard component, a hard portion of wet well water, and that predisposes people to stone. The number one state in this country for kidney stones is North Carolina, and the third reason is because they drink a lot of teas, and teas have a lot of oxalate. So putting those three things together makes North Carolina the highest incidence of stones in our country. And guess what? It's getting worse. <clears throat> so this is future predictions for kidney stones. So that belt is going higher. Uh, looking at us in Tahoe, we look, look to be still okay and heading into the 2095, but my ancestors in Philadelphia are going to be in trouble. Six types of stones. We're going to focus on one tonight. The stones on the right, cysteine stones, xanthine stones, silica stones, even struvite stones, these are rare. Typically, they're congenital conditions or infectious conditions, and you would know by now if you have these conditions. 80 to 85 percent of people in our community form stones, form calcium stones. Um, there's another small percentage who form uric acid stones. That's primarily related to a high protein intake, a high animal meat intake, as well as a condition known as gout. So people who have gout can form uric acid stones. <clears throat> How do you prevent kidney stones? 
The current recommendation is that you need to produce two liters of urine a day. That's a lot. That means you have to drink three liters of water. Try doing that. I've tried because I tell everyone to do it, and then one day someone said to me, you do that? And I said, well, I have my water with me, but I never really measured. It's pretty hard to drink three liters of water a day. But you want to keep that urine, um, con you don't want it, that urine to get concentrated, so you want to keep it diluted. Uh, there was some interesting studies that came out about the use of calcium intake. Women used to come into a CS about 10, 15 years ago and say, oh my lord, for bone health I've been taking calcium. Is that going to cause kidney stones? And what we know is the answer is no. Your GI tract and your entire system, your bone system, is actually pretty good at regulating the calcium in your blood. It actually takes some severe systemic conditions for you to get into a calcium metabolism issue. So a normal calcium intake is healthy. Low is bad, a super amount of calcium is bad too, but most people don't take in that much amount of calcium in their diet. Salt is bad, the reason why is that the sodium component of salt, sodium chloride, works on one of the same pumps in the kidney. So as you have to push that extra sodium out to make more urine and get it out of your body, you actually take calcium with it, so you have more calcium in your urine. Animal protein is important for two reasons. One, for uric acid stones, but second, because it causes an increasing acidity to your urine. And when the urine gets more acidic, it's easier for stones to form. I tell people to increase their physical activity because that's um, obesity is linked to stones as well. But make sure you balance that out with taking in more fluids. <clears throat> Hot climate, low fluid intake, high sunlight, high altitude, being outside, welcome to Tahoe. So this is why kidney stones form in our community. A lot of us are outside, we don't realize what we're doing. We're hiking, we're doing exercise, it's hot out. You're losing significantly more water than you appreciate. So on the right you see when the urine gets saturated, a whole bunch of fancy stuff happens and then you form stones. <clears throat> what can you do to prevent it? Your risk of developing stones is related to your diet. If you, drink, if you eat meat, your risk of forming stones is significantly higher than if you're a vegan. So that goes across the board. It has to do with protein, it has to do with salt intake, and there are high oxalate foods, so things like spinach, rhubarb, beets, and these are counterintuitive. People always come in the office and say, I'm going to cut out McDonald's and I'm going to eat healthy, but it's not always the unhealthy things that are bad for kidney stones. So it's important if you have a risk of kidney stones, you educate yourself about what is bad foods. And the third thing I always say is <clears throat> citric acid actually prevents calcium and oxalate from sticking together. So squirting lemon juice in your water can have a dramatic impact on your risk for stones. All right, the most common thing that I deal with, urination issues, both men and women. So we'll talk about enlarging prostates, and we'll talk about incontinence. Two out of three women in this country suffer from urinary incontinence. That's a massive number. 80% of them never seek care. The reason is they think it's normal, their friends have it, and they're embarrassed to talk about it. We published that article in JAMA about 10 years ago. And what we know is that it's an epidemic. 200 million women worldwide are dealing with urinary incontinence. It's a massive number. One in four over the 18 will have an episode of incontinence. And the reasons are common. They're unavoidable. Hours in labor, pregnancy, the use of forceps, aging. All of these things are unavoidable, but can have a dramatic impact in the quality of life. There's different types of incontinence. There's four actually defined types of incontinence, but really focus on the two on the left. The overflow incontinence typically has to do with some form of obstruction, more common in men, and the neurogenic incontinence is due to spinal cord injuries, MS, Parkinson's disease, a pure neurologic condition. But the two incontinence types that we deal with are mainly stress and urge. <clears throat> what is stress incontinence? It's a simple concept. If the pressure inside your belly when you cough, laugh, sneeze, or pick up something heavy is higher than the pressure that's blocking your urine from leaking, it's going to go out. So women will tell you when I cough, laugh, or sneeze, or I pick up something heavy, that's why I leak. So one of the most important things we can do is teach women the correct way to do Kegel exercises. That small muscle below your bladder is no different than your bicep. If every one of us in this room went to the gym every day and only worked out our right bicep eight times a day for the next six months, we'd all have huge right biceps. If we did the same thing for our sphincter muscle, we'd all be the Arnold Schwarzenegger of Kegel exercises, and leakage would not be as big of a problem. Urge incontinence is slightly different. This has nothing to do with pressures or outlet. This has to do with an irritation of the bladder muscle or the nerves that provide innervation to the bladder muscle and is a urgency, frequency, and a rush to have to go to the bathroom. It's very different and easily to tell the difference between stress and incontinence. Causes, 
Again, a lot of these things are unavoidable. Childbirth, genetics, age, but we can affect obesity. <clears throat> what we know is that the risk of having urge incontinence and stress incontinence is directly correlated to your BMI. So losing weight, being healthy can take it away. And chronic cough increases your risk of incontinence as well. So there's blood pressure medication known as ACE inhibitors that can put you at increased risk for coughing. We recommend you don't take those if you can avoid them, if you can try other medicines. And smoking clearly is one of the worst things you can do for your body. <clears throat> urge incontinence. Um, my biggest offenders are teachers and nurses um, because they don't have time to go to the bathroom. A lot of us get very busy in our day and such simple things as making sure you drink water and you actually go and use the bathroom every three to four hours actually can have a dramatic impact on how much pressure and stress you put on your bladder. So <clears throat> I'm not saying I have an easy way to tell your supervisor that you have to take a break every three to four hours, but it makes a big difference. Kegel exercises are one of my favorite things to do. It can have a huge impact on your urinary tract. And what we know is if we strengthen this muscle the correct way, which is important, we can really avoid having to do any interventions in about 85% of women. <clears throat> so how do you do a Kegel exercise? There's a lot of ways that doctors will teach you to do this. If we explain to women in the office exactly how to do these exercises, but don't teach them certain tricks, 75% of people, when hooked up to a biometric test to look and see if they're isolating that muscle, do it wrong. So just reading about it is not the right way. <clears throat> so this is a little bit crude, I apologize. But the best way to do a Kegel exercise is imagine you had an egg and it was in your backside and you had to crack it, okay? Everyone's doing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> That's an incredibly important tool because if you're not doing it right, you're squeezing your belly or your backside or you're squeezing your legs, you're not doing the right thing. It's like going to the gym and trying to make your, make your right bicep you know, really strong and only working out your, your back. It's not going to work. You have to isolate that muscle correctly. So um, I throw that term around loosely, but it makes a big difference. Um, another preventative thing that rooted in acupuncture is posterior tibial nerve stimulation. I love this one. We can predict your risk of having incontinence issues by how well you can actually spread your toes. So if you go home and you take your shoes off, not now, you can actually spread your toes out, and how well you can do that, or how well that nerve works, actually predicts how well you can, your bladder will function. And it has to do with how that posterior tibial nerve comes back to the same sacral root or area in your lower spine that the bladder comes off of. So what we do in our office for women who don't like medicines, or don't want to take medicines, or have side effects from medicines, we actually have a stimulator, a posterior tibial nerve stimulator, where we overstimulate that nerve, and then it down-regulates on a spinal level the nerve out to the bladder, and reduces overactivity by over 50%. So it's a great option, and I always, you know, in, in medicine, we always, we always, people always come in and ask me about acupuncture. I'm going to take, you know, this thing that I bought in India, and is it going to work? And I don't know half the time, because half the time I don't know this stuff. But this is rooted in acupuncture. We've got statistical evidence and scientific evidence that this works. <clears throat> BPH, a large prostate. So uh, the prostate provides a lot of the nutrients that sperm need to survive. When we used to live to be four years old, it never gave us any trouble. Now it's the biggest pain in the neck because it keeps growing and growing and growing. Food to the prostate is testosterone. Testosterone is available to men throughout their lifetime. Men can have kids at age 90. But with that comes the, the problems of an enlarging prostate. Your risk of having an enlarged prostate equals your age. So the men who are bothered, look at your age, that's the percent. If you're 50, 50% 50 of guys are starting to get annoyed. If you're 100, it's all of you. <clears throat> PPH affects 27 million men, one of the most prevalent conditions in this country, one of the most expensive for our Medicare system to take care of. And there's a lot of risk factors. Again, some of the things we can't affect, our race, our age, our family history. But we can't affect diet. <clears throat> PPH is inflammation. It's a growing prostate that can get inflamed. In fact, you hear a lot of times people say, I have prostatitis or an inflammation of my prostate. But it's not due to an infection. It just gets inflamed. And that has to do a lot with our diet. Anything you can do that inhibits inflammation in your body, like omega-3s and salmon, antioxidants in tomatoes and berries, blueberries being the best one, all these things will promote BPH health and reduce your chance of having an episode of inflammation. My favorite is salt palmetto. Um, this is from a small seed and bark of a tree that grows in southeastern America and in, the, in South America. <clears throat> what we know is that salt palmetto works on the same exact receptor as the drug Proscar and Avidar. If you ever heard of anyone with large prostate, these are two common medicines we use to shrink the prostate. It prevents the conversion of testosterone, which causes the prostate to grow, to dihydrotestosterone, which is the functionally active form in the prostate. So if you block that, 
specific to the prostate, you won't have the increase in growth and you'll have a little bit of a decline. This has been studied. It's something you can easily take over the counter that has shown an increase in symptom scores and an increase in quality of life. <clears throat> Last but not least, male sexual health. I got good news. There's a lot we can fix. <clears throat> the risk of having erectile dysfunction again equals your age. Something men don't talk about. Just like the breast cancer law. I wish someone in this country would donate to some research. I wish politicians would step up. Half of our Congress and Senate is 70 years old. I know they're dealing with ED. No one's willing to admit it or we'd have significant more funding. So what are the causes? There, before I talk about the medical causes, it's important to point out there's always a risk of stress. There's always a risk of psychological causes. Typically, this is my younger guy who's focused on it, who really has no other side effects, and we can get them counseling to help with this. When we talk about the physical causes of erectile dysfunction, one of the most common is medications. <clears throat> the second most common is surgery, prostate cancer surgery perhaps being the, the largest, colon cancer surgery, some of those spinal surgeries can actually affect these nerves. But the majority of causes are due to heart disease, diabetes, drinking, and smoking. If you take a, 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 a pie graph and look at the number one, number one, number two causes for erectile dysfunction, their cardiovascular disease and their diabetes. Seventy-five percent of men in this country who come into my office with erectile dysfunction, it's a blood flow issue. So there are smaller causes, hormonal issues. There are neurologic causes like we talked about. But 75 to 80 percent of the men, it's due to blood flow. Not enough blood is getting into the penis for an erection that is strong enough, or more importantly, lasts long enough for sexual activity. <clears throat> and I call it the canary in the coal mine. Because what we know is that if you're having a heart attack of your penis, you're going to have a heart attack of your heart in the future if you don't do something about it. We published data about two years ago that looked at the number of men coming into my office who have erectile dysfunction. 25% of them never saw the primary care doctor. So these guys are, are ticking time bombs. They're sitting on the couch, they're not active. Finally, they came to see a doctor because of this. And if you know men, it takes their leg falling off to come see me. But erectile dysfunction gets a lot of men off the couch for the first time, and they need to see a primary care doctor. If you come in and see me and you have new wants and ED, I make sure you have a primary care doctor. Because although I think sex is important, I also need to be around here to have sex. So we make sure that your heart is healthy. <clears throat> what can you do to avoid it? Um, L-arginine works on something called nitric oxide. Um, Pfizer recommended this and discovered it in 1994 when they were doing a study on blood flow for a condition called pulmonary hypertension and they discovered men got erections back and we got Viagra. Works the same way. So this is sort of the precursor to Viagra. Maintaining dental health, weight loss, stop smoking, physical activity, all these things can help improve blood supply. And all these things can have an effect on how well the blood is getting into the penis so you can have a better erection. <coughs> Last thing, low T, the largest growing condition that we see. If there's one thing I would say to you that's become a hot topic, it's low testosterone. Made the cover of Time Magazine in 2014, something that they like to call menopause, although we can get even now. <clears throat> male menopause, or low testosterone. Why don't we call it male menopause? Because it happens so gradually that men don't notice it. Women undergo menopause and the hormonal changes happen over the course of a couple of years. Men, it's a gradual decline. Testosterone peaks at around age 25 to 30, goes down 1% per year each year to hit around 50 or 55, and then goes down even further. So this is a age-specific condition, and it has specific signs. There are two different signs that I say. We used to believe that testosterone was only about being a guy, right? Locker room talk, sex drive, energy level, erections. But with increasing body of evidence that it's incredibly important in your metabolic health, it's a component of a hormonal health, a metabolic syndrome. And we're finding that testosterone replacement impacts bone health, heart health, insulin metabolism, and a whole bunch of different medical conditions that we neglected for a period of time. So <clears throat> signs of low testosterone are pretty predictable, tired all the time. Women come in and say, Doc, he falls asleep on the couch every day at 5 o'clock. And say, well, let's check some testosterone. It's not the only cause, but it's one of the things that we have to rule out. I apologize, you can't really see this well. What are the causes? Pretty predictable, but some exceptions here. Alcohol abuse, diabetes. Diabetes damages the blood vessels. It damages the nerves. That's a one-two punch for blood flow and erections. Obesity, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and smoking. The smoking damages the lining of your artery. When you damage the lining, lipids get in there, fat gets in there, it gets hardened, and all of a sudden the blood can't get in there for a strong enough erection. Opioid abuse, an epidemic in our country, is actually having increased risk on testosterone production and that situation lowers it. 
What can you do? Pretty simple, get a good night's sleep. Sugar is the devil. Um, get some old fashioned exercise, lose weight. And the one thing we do recommend, besides testosterone replacement, which we're not gonna get into tonight, is zinc. What we know is that zinc is a vital component of the function of a cell called the ligand cell. It's the cell in the testicle that produces testosterone. It binds to the lighting cell receptor and promotes the reduction of something called reactive oxygen species and improves your ability to produce testosterone. I'd like to thank everyone for listening. I know I covered a lot of ground. Um, hopefully I was a good tour guide. That's me at the top of TALAC. <coughs> so I'm available for questions. Yes. Is there a double-edged sword with the... Um testosterone causing more cancer? So, yes and no. <clears throat> what we know is that testosterone, if you, so any man who's considering starting testosterone should have a PSA test and a rectal exam. And what we don't recommend is anyone with a PSA value greater than three, just slightly lower than normal, be prescribed testosterone without being worked up for prostate cancer. Prostate, testosterone does not cause prostate cancer. It's been studied, it was an article in the New England Journal of Medicine. But, it is the fuel on the fire if you have prostate cancer. So if there's no fire and you have gasoline on it, nothing's going to happen. You don't have prostate cancer, it can't make it worse. It's not going to cause it. If you have prostate cancer and you take testosterone, you're getting into a problematic situation. And follow up. Yeah. If you have it, what about protein um, being therapy? Are you a proponent of that? So, uh, yes and no. Um, Prostate cancer can be treated one of four ways. First way is with hormones. Hormones stop the growth, so shut down testosterone, and the cancer can't grow. The second option is surgery. There is a large, when we take the prostate out using the robot, we have the robot here at the hospital. Second is active surveillance, which is we watch a lot of guys now, because we know that low rate, low risk disease, we don't have to treat. Radiation therapy is what we used to use to treat prostate cancer. 15 years ago, we had two forms of radiation to treat prostate cancer. External beam, where we deliver the x-rays from the outside, and internal in the form of seed, something called brachy therapy, which men used to have. As the technology for delivering radiation got better, as our imaging techniques got better, our ability to cure cancers got higher with radiation delivered from outside of the body. The rate-limiting step in the whole options in treating prostate cancer was damage to adjacent structures. When we deliver radiation outside of the body to an organ that, organ that is tucked into the pelvis and surrounded by other things that are important, like the bladder, the nerves, the blood vessels, the rectum, we can damage those structures. Proton therapy came about as an idea where the entrance and the exit of the radiation waves do not damage adjacent tissues enough. It used to be important. Ten years ago when it came about, we thought it was going to be career changing. We thought it was going to be the, the wave of the future. But what we know is that the technology for delivering normal external beam radiation and the use of advanced MRI machines are equal in success rates and equal in side effect rates for proton therapy. So it is a perfectly reasonable option. It works very well for cure rates, but it costs about $300,000. So it's tough for me to justify for Medicare to pay for that, when, or Medicare tells me, when I tell Medicare, but Medicare tells me I can't you know, send guys for that because the success rates are the same, the side effect profiles are the same, but the cost is so dramatically higher. Now where do we use it? Proton therapy has revolutionized pediatric brain tumors where every millimeter matters. Base of tongue tumors, there's certain tumors in the body where we use proton therapy. So we had a proton machine, an accelerator, a pen and chop, and we use it a lot in pediatric tumors where every millimeter matters. The world of prostate cancer, I send two, two to five guys a year for proton therapy, who specifically ask for it, who go and get it. But if offered the options, I don't think it matters. Unless it matters to you. I mean, if you're someone who's interested in it, we send you down to UCSF, you can have the conversation, and they're willing to do it. First one. First one. First one. First one in the world. I don't know. Um, the machine costs about a billion dollars. So, I don't know how bad it is. <laughs> yeah. It's about the size of a city block. I mean, you have to see this thing. It's the accelerator. It's, it's out of this world. Yes? You were mentioning the teeth. I'd like to have a teeth without sugar or anything. 
Yeah. Is that what you were talking about? Sure. So one of the highest, it's not bad. Um, teas are high in oxalates, and certain teas are worse than others. So you can look on the on the package and see exactly what's in there. But when we're talking about people who are at risk for forming calcium oxalate stones, you want to do three things. Well, you want to do ten things, and one through eight is drink more water. But one of them is limit the oxalates in your diet. So I do see one person a month who comes in and I say, you know, I rattle off the things not to do, and they say, wait, no tea, that's all I drink. And modulating that or adjusting it can really reduce stone formation. So if you love tea, don't stop. I mean, as a doctor, I'm not here to you know, tell you what not to do. But if you want to, eating, increasing the water in your diet actually can counterbalance the bad stuff. <clears throat> yeah. It's like a Catholic school dance from the 50s. That's how I look at kidney stones. The more water, the bigger the auditorium. You don't want the boys and the girls to dance. And the lemon juice is just chaperones. <laughs> I didn't. My mom did. That's what she told me. It's all right. <laughs> Any more questions about urology? Uh, I'm a type 2 diabetic. Uh, there's no history of diabetes on either side of my family, yeah. going back generations. Yep. And uh, mine is chemically induced. It's dioxin poisoning. Yep. I have growths on my thyroid. I also have nodules in my lung. Yeah. And uh, I want to, you know, how does like dioxin poisoning uh, affect what you're talking about? So, not directly. Um, I would have to look that up specifically because like, it's not something that we commonly deal with. But if we extrapolate that a lot of the issues that we deal with have to do with diabetes, and that's probably a, lo a large component of what you're dealing with. Controlled diabetes, controlled insulin levels, is the same thing as being non-diabetic. So if you have your hemoglobin A1C under control, you're careful with what you eat and what you exercise. You keep those sugars in the normal range. You never let those negative side effects occur. So I'm not, I don't know any specific examples of dioxin poisoning, causing cancer, causing kidney stones, or affecting voiding. But the effects on diabetes, if we can control that, and I don't know if it's harder to control from dioxin poisoning, I'm not sure of that. But if you can keep that under control, you can have limited side effects just like the person who doesn't have that. And the other another question is I've had uh, urinary tract infections for the past four years. Yeah. And the only thing we provided were antibiotics, and none of them work. You know, it'll go away for two weeks, and then it's back. You know, with, you know, for the vengeance. Well, two risk factors. So, anytime people have urinary tract infections, I always look at three things. Number one is there's something anatomically about you that's predisposing you to have an infection. So, you got a kidney stone in there, you have a blocked kidney, or are you not emptying well because your prostate's enlarged? If you're not emptying well because your prostate's enlarged, which is incredibly common in men. If you add your sugars aren't controlled, it's a setup for infection. If you let your blood sugar ever get above 180, it will spill sugar into the urine. And that's a petri dish for bacteria. So a little bit of trapped urine, a little bit of bacteria in there, and high sugar levels, that's a setup for these rip roaring infections to happen. So the best thing, good glycemic control, adequate bladder emptying, and making sure you drink a lot of food water so you flush it out. You do those three things and you're careful about it, you really can prevent infections dramatically. If that doesn't work, we have medicines to shrink the prostate. If that doesn't work, there are prophylactic measures you can do to prevent infections. Vitamin C and cranberry extract prevent bacteria from sticking to your urinary tract. And even in some situations, low-dose daily antibiotics can reset the bad bacteria that may be growing on your body into a good bacteria environment and prevent this cycle from so this helps a lot. Well, I've had you know, a number of cystoscopies and stuff like that, so I mean, that's all been checked out. Okay. But uh, yeah, can you tell me how uh, uh, major seals form and, and why the direction of one is so dramatic you know, when you have that surgery? Yeah. Um, I don't know if anyone knows what a hydro seal is. It's, the testicle is bathed in a little bit of fluid, and there's a, a little bit of uh, that is made every day, and there's a little bit that's absorbed every day, and that's a balance. It's, that happens not only in your testicle, it happens in the surrounding of your lungs and the surrounding of your heart, and we all have these thin fluids that surround it so we can move around a little bit, specifically the testicle. Anything that throws that balance out of whack will cause an increased production, but doesn't affect the absorption. Trauma, getting kicked, infections, 
low, you know, STDs, anything that caused that, that to be out of whack. And most of the time, it's something you don't realize. You roll over wrong or you lift in something heavy. Produces more fluid, right? And it builds up. Sometimes it gets big, sometimes it tastes small, sometimes it goes away. The problem with treating them is, the first thing is, there's no risk to having them. In fact, a lot of men have them and live with them. Sometimes they get massive, they bother you. And that's the only reason we treat them. And the reason why it's problematic is because the same reason that caused that hydrocele, trauma, getting kicked, is exactly what I do to fix it. So the surgery to get rid of fluid that's swelling causes fluid and swelling. So it's a sensitive area. It's a annoying area to have surgery. It's an area prone to swelling. And it's an area that's going to swell up from what I do to take away swelling. So just understanding the risks and that balance that happens is important going into it. Now that said, if it bothers you and you understand all of that, we can do a surgery and they're incredibly successful. There's a lot of tricks. Like if you're going to have surgery, I recommend you go out and buy biking shorts in a size too small. Pull it up really tight, holds everything in there for a few weeks, really prevents swelling. So I got a whole bunch of tricks to help. <laughs> Any other questions? <clears throat> There's a plug for Barton. Um, yes. Recently bringing you on board as a urologist. Um, Barton also invested in a million plus dollar MRI machine. Yes. Which is the advanced imaging you're talking about. So now we're able to start doing prostates for the first time ever at Barton yeah. um, without the probes. Yes. Which makes it very attractive for men that uh, have been avoiding it for years because they don't want Yeah. It. It's important to point out that the paradigm in this country, which remains in this country for prostate cancer screening, is a rectal exam and a PSA test. That changed this year in Europe and Australia. In Europe and Australia, if you have an elevated PSA test or you have an, an abnormal rectal exam, you don't need to go right to biopsy. To date, prostate is the only organ in the body that when we're concerned about cancer, we do blind biopsies. Which in my eyes is crazy, it has been crazy for a decade. In Europe and Australia, if you have an elevated PSA, you get an MRI. In this country, we're still behind the times. If we were sitting in this room in a year, I hope, in three years, in fact, two days ago, I heard about an insurance carrier will cover it. I think in one year, MRI is going to replace biopsy. An MRI does three things. <clears throat> Number one, it's negative 30% of the time. 30% of negative MRIs allow me not to biopsy men. You high five and you walk out and I see it six months with the PSA. Guys love that. They want me to leave them alone. If you have a positive MRI, it allows me to target the areas of concern, in areas of concern, for two reasons. Number one, I don't detect clinically insignificant cancers, which we were doing for a long time, and overtreat that. But I do make sure that we sample and biopsy the areas that are concerning, so we increase our detection rate and improve survival. The MRI machine is going to revolutionize prostate cancer treatment. In fact, I try and order them on everyone. I just get rejected 90% of the time. <laughs> Yeah, it's fast. We didn't have it. We, we didn't have an MRI machine doing prostate MRIs until June. The whole team went out. They learned a whole bunch of new software. We've been working together to make sure our biopsy rates correlate with the abnormal areas, and we've had fantastic results. The biopsy causes breast cancer? In certain organs, yes. In prostate, no. It's an old wide scale that when the air hits it, the cancer spreads. What we usually know is that logic was wrong. It wasn't that the biopsy caused it or the air hitting it caused it to spread, it's we discovered that it had already spread. When you biopsy prostate cancer, and you go through the rectum and you take a biopsy, we've done studies about the rates of progression afterwards, and it has never improved the risk of extra prostatic extension. Certain organs, it matters. Certain tumors, it does matter. Put a needle in certain organs, and you pull that needle out, you can spread that cancer. Prostate cancer is not one of them. We've been biopsy prostates for almost 40 years. So, if there's any questions that you'd like to ask me, I'll stick around. Uh, there's business cards in the back if you want to come to my office. I promise I'll be gentle. <laughs>